Time Machine. Hi there, it's Claire here and welcome to Hot Pod Time Machine. This is the podcast where we talk about a decision from our past which changed the trajectory of our future. And I am very excited to welcome on this episode's lovely Elizabeth Maxwell. Hello, Elizabeth. Claire. Thank you very much <laughs> for being here. Now, I'm very excited to have Elizabeth on this podcast because we met at a convention very recently and hit it off. And I think it's because we're astrology twins. I've mm-hmm. never met. So when's your birthday? Mine's the 12th of October. October 13th. Yes. And I won't say the year. Well, everyone knows how old I am, but like <laughs> everyone knows how old I am, but we're born in the same year. And like, I think our charts were very similar. Have you ever met anyone with a very similar chart like that before? No, because if I remember correctly, we not only do we clearly have the same sun sign, um, we have the same rising and moon sign, yeah. which I've never met any. I don't think I've ever met anybody who has the same, like two of the same three as me, yeah. much less all three of the same. And then, and then didn't we like line up in like the first like eight or nine houses or something like that? Yeah, it's like my <laughs> friend is currently doing, she's actually moved on to your chart. Now she's about to do your chart. Um, and she said she's really enjoying it. And she said, I, I said to her, she did my chart before and she was like, yes, you are very similar, but there are some differences there. So I'm excited to see and she showed me what your chart looked like they do look in the wheel of the thing they do look slightly different so i'm interested because when you said libra i was like libra yes capricorn i was like oh okay, oh okay and this actually i was freaked out i was like who are you oh my god why did we meet but i like that at conventions you know sometimes you meet lovely folks there have you met quite a lot of folks like friends and things like that doing conventions Yeah, I have. Although funny enough, it's also like voice acting is such a solitary job. And I I think a lot of people just don't realize that they, you know, think we get to like record with everybody that we're in the show with. And so there are so many voice actors that I am regularly like cast in shows with, but I don't ever get to see them because we record separately. So it's like I get to meet a bunch of wonderful new people but it's actually some of the only times that I get to see my colleagues too yep yep it's weird though a lot of people say that and it's not very often that I meet voice actors that say oh no we were in the same room together because I imagine that I I would like to bounce off someone would you prefer that if you're oh yeah I mean that would be the dream but it's like only the really big budget shows and Excuse me, I'm drinking sparkling water, so I'm probably going okay. to a lot. Um, it's only like the really big budget shows and usually comedies like, you know, Bob's Burgers and Family Guy and The Simpsons, where they like spend that money to have everybody come in together because the comedy is so reliant on, you know, the chemistry and the timing and stuff. But it's just um, the logistics and the budget, like they just get so complicated that that's usually the reason why you are recording alone because it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot easier but artistically it's harder now i'm wondering because this is about a decision from your past that changed your future i'm wondering if it's a work-based one but what did you before you go before you go into it because we're talking a little bit about work which we don't have to of course because this is a meandering podcast uh, when i first asked you Oh, yeah, it's about a decision from your past that changed your future. What were the kind of things that went through your mind before you came to the thing you're going to talk about? Definitely, like you were saying, like the different like aspects of my life. Mm. Because, you know, there's kind of, I guess there's work and there's personal and then you can break it down like even more than that. But it's like some of the personal stuff is almost like so personal (laughs) you're like do I really want to get into this with like (laughs) you know thousands of of strangers um but that was some of the main stuff so I kind of pretty quickly decided to go the work route especially because who I am as a person is so intertwined in my work because I love what 
I do. Mm-hmm. Like I really identify uh, who I am as a person is is closely tied with what I do for a living. Um, and I feel very lucky, you know, for that. Like I, I feel very lucky that I love my job and it defines a lot of like who I am. Um, and so then it was just kind of like, I was like, okay, I'm not going to think about this too hard. I'm just going to like do it let it go. And then like, see like what kind of like percolates into my brain first. And that's kind of how I decided like, which, which story I was going to share. Cause I feel like there are so, I feel like there are surprisingly a number of these that like came to mind. Yeah, man. I mean, I was just like, holy crap. (laughs) Think about all the decisions we make all the time and even I think about this myself I I think about the small decisions I make or the people I meet that end up affecting me in very big ways it's a very it is a hard one but what you said there resonated with me because I would probably choose work that resonates with my Capricorn moon because my whole identity (laughs) is work I love work I love work and so Elizabeth tell me what is the decision that you want to talk about today well, do you want me to like get into the story or just like preface with the decision? Oh, no, get into the story. Let's go. Okay. So I'm going to bring you back to like, oh gosh, what would it have been? Like 2000. Oh, I probably should have looked this up. Hold on. It's this is probably like 2015, 2016. Okay. And I had recently moved from Los Angeles to Austin, Texas, uh, for personal reasons. And I was an actor, but I was like moving from a, you know, the largest market probably in the world for actors into a much smaller market. And I knew that I had, if I wanted to continue to try and make any sort of living as um, an artist, I needed to kind of broaden my horizons. And I had previously only been doing on camera work and I decided to try my hand at voiceover. So I put together a demo reel and I did a bunch of research on, on um, companies that I knew would like hire voice actors in a certain radius of where I lived. And one of them was Funimation, now Crunchyroll. And I emailed them my demo reel and like an introduction letter and was like, Hey, like I'm new to the area. I would love to audition for you if the opportunity arises, yada, yada, yada. And heard nothing. And I followed up a month later, heard nothing, followed up another month later, heard nothing. And I continued to do this, but just kind of like gave up a little bit. And, um, I was also doing on camera work in Austin and a, casting director that I really admired in town had, uh, what did she, what was the actual name of the event? She had a charity event and I think it was called food for monologues or something akin to that, where she would gather a bunch of, you know, local casting directors and she set up a time at a theater and um, you could come in with your headshot and resume and do a monologue for this panel of casting directors And uh, your price of admission was to bring in, you know, like a tote bag full of like canned food or, you know, food items to be to be donated to a local food pantry, which I thought was just an amazing idea. And so I volunteered to uh, work uh, this event and keep in mind I was in Austin, Texas, and um, Crunchyroll is in Flower, well, Dallas, Texas, which is about a three and a half, four hour drive from sure. Austin. Okay. And um, I, we were in a lull and I was checking my email on my phone and I saw that after eight months of reaching out to them, I had received an email And it said, hey, Elizabeth, um, we are auditioning for a new show called Attack on Titan. Um, Today is the last day of auditions and we have a couple of slots still open. Would you like to come in and read for us? And the the slot, like the last slot they had open was literally like three and a half hours from the time that I opened the email. So I basically had to make a very split 
decision, split minute, split second, decision, split second decision of like, was I going to drop everything and clamber into my car and make like a three and a half hour drive <laughs> up to Dallas, Texas for an audition, like not even a job, like not even anything I was going to be paid for. And then like read for 10 minutes and then turn around and drive three and a half hours back to Austin all in one day. That's a seven hour round trip taking a huge chance. And you did it right, obviously. I, (laughs) this also shows you like why I'm a Libra and why I have like flair for the dramatic. (laughs) Um, I waited for like maybe 15 seconds and then was just like, screw it. It could all be worth it. And I, I put down my phone and I turned to like the other actors who were volunteering and was like, guys, I have to go. My (laughs) destiny is calling. (laughs) I love that. And they were like, what? (laughs) Okay. You're like, do you know what? That I love that though. And so when you got there, obviously when you get to an audition, you need to be in a certain mind frame but you did you just get there on time just get out your car straight in like what was it like pretty much it was like I literally like sprinted out of the theater got in my car drove straight up there thankfully didn't get lost um walked in like literally gave the receptionist my name and she was like oh great perfect they're ready to see you now and then like was literally ushered immediately um (laughs) to a recording booth I had, I think, maybe 60 seconds to review the characters. Because usually what they do is they have you, they give you like this binder of like all like all the main female characters that they're reading for. And they'll ask you to select like two or three that you want to read for. Sure, okay. You know, they typically kind of cover like the archetypes of, of the show. And so I I think I had like 60 seconds to look over the binder and decide which characters I wanted to read for. And then like basically had to go straight into it. <laughs> oh my God. But you know what? In a way, you probably did it the right way because you went in probably, probably with no other thoughts apart from get there, do it, get back. There's no thinking for days before. I don't know how you like to prepare for auditions, but I work best when I just do it. Like, I, if I think too hard, I start to mess up. I need to kind of just be bold. Are you kind of like that too? Or do you prefer more prep time? Well, I mean, you know, <laughs> it's a fine line. Like, I'm very type A. I do like to do, like, my due diligence and research and stuff, like, when I can. Mm-hmm. But, like, as an actor, I do tend to be pretty instinctual. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times I like my first read or my first take on things better than the takes where I'm like, okay, I'm going to, like, break down the script and, like, you know, do all this blah, blah, blah stuff. Um, so I do think that it was, like, a, a blessing in disguise that I didn't have time to, like, psych myself up. Like, I literally had to like show up and just do the thing. But I was also really glad, like I didn't have time to prepare, but I'd been training for so long Mm -hmm. that it was like a lot of your artist instincts kick in, if that that makes sense. 100%, of course, you know, so it comes naturally. But you know, as you were telling that story, I was sadly thinking about the astrology of it all. So I was like, well, of course, it's very dramatic. It's very Libran. It's a business decision. It's very Capricorn moon. And it's very bold and risky. Sagittarius rising. And I probably would have done exactly the same. Guys, I'm going. I'll see you. I will see you. But that decision, I mean, goodness, like, I wouldn't have met. Like, we wouldn't have met. You know, you wouldn't have gone where you've gone now and like done all the things that you've done. So what an incredible like choice. Have you always been like that? Have you always been quite bold in your decision making? Yeah, which is interesting because I don't think of myself as like a risk taker. Mm. Um, 
I usually really like to like weigh my options and the pros and cons. And I like to, I like think a lot before I speak, you know, it's like, I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty thoughtful person with my thought processes. And I don't tend to make a lot of like split second decisions if I'm given the option. Right. But if I'm not given the option, I do tend to subscribe to the go big or go home ideology. Hell yeah. And I just feel like, I feel like it's ended up serving me well. Cause I won't, I won't go into this story. Um, cause it's not the one we're talking about, but, um, like the decision, basically the process of me auditioning for and getting cast in Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild was very similar to this one. Oh. And it was kind of like I made a really big, really risky, fast decision and it ended up like paying off. And I'm not saying like, I'm like, yes, be risky about everything in your life, you know, but I do feel like there's an element of what do they say? Like luck is the confluence of um, like timing and preparedness or something like that. Yeah, I know. I know. I don't think that's the exact wording, but I know which fra- I know the phrase, the thing that you're thinking of. Exactly. Yes. Like, I feel like most things in life do not just fall into your lap. Like you are presented often with an opportunity, but you have to choose to like take it. Yes. And a lot of times those opportunities are not convenient. They're not easy. They're not, you know, they're, they can be a pain in the butt. They can be time consuming. They can be, you know, like I said, inconvenient. And um, I just feel like I would rather choose a day of like inconvenience for a bigger payoff. And, you know, at the end of the day, if I, if I, if I bet wrong, if I lose, well, I had a day of inconvenience. Yeah. And I, I've been, I don't know, I've been watching a lot of, I think I've been, you know, the last couple of days before this podcast, I've been watching a lot of woo woo stuff on YouTube about the universe and manifestation I'm, I'm, I'm all about the high vibrations now elizabeth i'm like hey man i'm just trying to stay in a high vibration dude and it's um so i watched one video today that said you know when the universe whatever you want to call it throws challenges at you it's how you rise to those challenges whether you win or lose and then whatever comes next according to how you've dealt with it is the payoff and I've often thought that when when bad things happen, I go, okay, I don't like it, but uh, you pick yourself up and you, you kind of start again kind of thing. But I'm kind yeah. of similar to you. I'm, I quite like, I like bullet points. I like admin. I like to know how much things cost and where I'm going. And I'm quite planned, but uh, sometimes I go a bit mad and go, no, I'll just do this now. And I just make a very big decision very, very fast. But... If I have to decide what to wear, going out takes me hours to decide. It's hard. <laughs> and I just like, I to kind of, I guess, touch on that woo-woo stuff. Like I don't, um, I am not a religious person. I do think uh, I'm a relatively spiritual person. I do believe in like a benevolent, 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 like universe that like wants what's best for us or pushes us towards our, you know, greater good. And it's like, I do feel in these moments that it's like, I get this kind of intuition almost yes. Yes. that like, take the leap, take the leap. Yes. <laughs> it's strange. And then you feel your whole body moving towards it. You're like, well, I have to do it. Like, have you always been like that since you were young? Were you always that person that in school or college or whatever else, you were like, yeah, like I, you felt things and you used your intuition? Yeah, I think so. Although it's interesting, isn't it? I feel like it was so much easier when we were younger. Yeah. Like, I mean, like, I feel like I had to, I had to kind of relearn how to like listen and trust that as I got older. Whereas when I was younger, I feel like it was just kind of like a mode that I like operated in continually, you know? Mm-hmm. So what's, um, what's intuition 
like for you now? Because I know I know what it's like for me and how I my brain operates. But so say for example, you feel yourself going towards a job or a a place to live or a friendship. It could be anything. What's the process that goes through your mind? Are you more careful now? Are you more considered now that you're older? It's interesting. It's it's so much simpler than I feel like I give it credit for sometimes. I had a I had a teacher tell me, um, if it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Mm. And I actually think that that is really indicative of how my intuition kind of works for me now is it's like, I can literally be given like an option or a person, a new person. And, and if I'm just willing to like, kind of be still and quiet enough to like, listen to myself for a minute, I will immediately get like a yes or no. Oh, you're so right. You know what? Like I, I have feel that more for with people than I do maybe for, uh, you know, like big decisions now, I think, oh, but what about this and money and things? It, you know, all of the, the worries of the world pour into my head. Um, but when I meet people, I get a sense straight away that I like someone. That's my hell yes, hell no moment. And there's something to be said for just sometimes leaving things as they are, like work or people, and just letting it lie. And if the universe shows you what it's going to show you, it will it will give you the things. But I've been very much into the that sort of universe speaking to you thing. And when I say, speak to some people about it, they roll their eyes and they go, oh, my God. Like, but have you I mean, I think spirituality, I don't believe in God or anything, but I think you can be spiritual. Have you, have you always been quite a spiritual person, would you say? Yeah, which is funny because I spent most of my young life going to um, religious schools. <laughs> like I uh, I went to a Catholic um, grade school and then I went to an Adventist junior high and I grew up in a community that had like a, a really um, large population of Mormons, Adventists and Mormons. And so I had a lot of like Adventist and Mormon friends growing up, but I've never, uh, I've never been religious. Yeah. Um, I've always... I've always been like an optimist and I feel like I've always been like pretty energetically sensitive and have felt like, um, you know, like I said, like I, I've always had this unwavering belief that like people are good, goodness is rewarded, love is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. And like, like I said, like, I don't know a better word than just saying that I believe the universe is ultimately benevolent. Yeah. Um, I don't really know where it came from. Probably, you know, my parents a lot, uh, I think, but that's just always how I felt. And I've never really, I've never really like fixated on religion or, or a deity that's like providing that stuff. It's same like amorphous. I feel like I meet, I meet so many different folks that have different sort of beliefs. I'd say that more in this industry, well, not all the time, but the people I meet and I vibe with always kind of, maybe think kind of how we're thinking you know they would say the same sort of similar things um but i do feel like the human race could benefit from thinking that way a little bit more instead of just going down the well all life is is paying bills you know and paying rent and procreating and and that's it and i i think we lose touch with ourselves a little bit and then there's less joy in work, you know, and there's less joy in friendships. There's just less joy. Um, I love people watching, you know, like when I'm traveling and things and just seeing people like move around like little zombies kind of thing. I think, God, like if people just stopped and like thought about that a little bit more and how we're all kind of connected. God, Elizabeth, I've watched too many YouTube videos, uh, but <laughs> my God, I'm obsessed. Oh my god! I'm gonna. You know what's gonna happen next? I'm gonna start sharing them with you on, on Instagram. You'll start getting the reels. Oh my god! You get stuck in the scroll <laughs> hole as well. What's your? Sorry, this is a very rude question. What's your? What's in your scroll hole, Elizabeth? Oh my god! Instagram <laughs> knows me quite well. It's um mostly animal videos. 
uh, cat and dog videos sure. followed by plant videos because I've, I've recently started um, really trying my hand at like growing more plants sure. and then, and then followed by like some like makeup tutorials. Okay. Okay. Right. So the algorithm got you, right? So yeah, the algorithm 100. And you know what? I'm totally okay with who I think that, like what that says about me as a person. <laughs> My inner all like, you're living in a video game and nothing matters. And then the next <laughs> ones are like, you know what? Like to manifest your perfect partner, blah, blah, blah. And it's all of these, these kind I'm thinking, how does it read me like this though? But I I'm no I'm not a plant person. I'm definitely an animal person. On my TikTok, it's all cute animals. So I've got a chive plant recently, Elizabeth, and I thought I can do this. I could be a plant person. It died in two days. I did water it. I gave it the sunlight. I watered it not too much and not too little. I spoke to it, and like you know, Mac was sniffing around, and I thought this guy is giving, and we're giving it love. It died, Elizabeth. What was I doing wrong? How can I be a plant person? Well, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that you may have overwatered it. You think so? Oh, yeah. That's like the number one sin I'm discovering to like being a plant parent. It's like we like helicopter parent our plants. <laughs> like, let me love you. Um, <laughs> Let's dry. I was uh, like, these are like dry chives. I need to water. I, I don't know. Sometimes like, sometimes they just like, if it was recently transplanted, it may not have just like, it may not have transplanted well, you know? I, I You know what? I'm just going to stick to plastic flowers and plastic things. Like, you know what? With how much you travel, I do actually think it can be difficult to like. Can't do have. it. So I am. I would not judge you. <laughs> I, I cannot. I cannot do it. I wanted to go back to the fact that you came from California to Texas, and now obviously you're working and everything, and like you're you're there and you're in that state. Would you? Is there any chance though you would ever move back or out to another state or even another country? Would it have to be for work or are you quite settled? Yeah, I mean, I love Austin. I really do. It's a wonderfully fun, enjoyable place to live. I like the weather. I like hot weather. Um, I love the people. I love how accessible the city is and there's like always something fun to do any night of the week. Um, I didn't leave LA because I was like, oh, I gotta get out of Los Angeles. Um, like a lot of people do understandably, but I didn't hate LA. I do like living in Austin better than I liked living in LA. Oh, interesting. But there, there is a part of me that feels like, I wonder if at some point I will have to move back for work because there is a lot more that you can do remotely these days, but there's still there's still a little bit of like a prejudice against hiring remote people for larger projects. And there is an element of sometimes it's just not as easy to break into the really like insular areas of certain parts of your career without like kind of being there in person and like trying to make those, you know personal connections so it sucks it's i don't like, it's kind of like london like if if i was to go back to scotland they've got there's bbc in scotland and things like that but it's not the same as being in london yeah. do you think that's fair that why why is the industry not catching up and just being a bit more open uh, some of it i think is just human nature both the good and the bad of it you know I, my my agent kind of joked to me that like some um some of the decision makers in our industry kind of have this like maybe even unconscious bias of like if i got to put up with living here then you have to put up with living here too <laughs> um which made me laugh and i but i think that there's some truth to it and but I also think that there is something to be said for like as humans, I think we do crave like as much in person personal connection as we can get, and we can achieve a lot more 
remotely than we ever were in the past. But for sometimes like the bigger projects or the longer running ones, um, like I, I understand that there's a desire to have that personal in-person connection, you 100%. know? percent. I imagine like, you know, working in a booth on your own, we touched upon that earlier, you know, it's much preferable to, preferable as an actor to work you know with people do you would you say there's a preference for on camera versus off camera or do you love it all and you don't mind any of it I do love it all and I would never want to have to give up one or the other sure. but I am totally happy with like two thirds to three quarters of my work being off camera and then like only a smaller part being on camera right now. Like, I mean, A, it makes life a lot simpler, yeah. <laughs> but B, there's just so like, it can be so frustrating to work on camera and have so much of the decision-making process feel like it's out of your hands. Like, oh, she doesn't have the right color hair. I could dye it. Casting director doesn't have the creativity to see it. Oh, she looks a little bit too much like my ex-girlfriend. You know, like, <laughs> oh my there's, God. Just so, there's just so many more limiting factors to me to working on camera. And voiceover, I feel a lot more freedom. I feel a lot more confident about going after what I want and not feeling like I'm going to be hindered by my physical appearance. Um, so it, it's a great boon to, to work in an industry where you feel powerless a lot of the times. Voiceover has given me a lot more of that feeling of control and power back. 100%. And creativity as, as well, because obviously as an actor, you know, I've got so many friends that are actors and uh, and, and work on you know, off camera. And that's 100%, that's what they always say. They can put on a mask and they can be so many different things. It is quite limiting. And the thing is, like, when you're going in, even with what I do, it's like, you know, they've got an idea of what they want uh, uh, and they see your vibe and they're like, no, no, but we want this sort of presenter or this sort of actor or for this sort of... And it sucks. <laughs> like, it so sucks. It, and now what I'm finding is more and more, I don't know if it's like this for you, but what I'm finding is companies or producers and directors, not all the time, but sometimes are going for influencers and mm. followers and uh, social clout. Now, there's nothing wrong with any of that because... There are people with lots of different talents, but I don't think we should start from that place. I think we should start from the place of who are you? Are you good enough for this? Is that is that something that's affecting your side of the industry as well, would you say? In, in ways, I think I noticed that particular phenomenon a little bit more with on-camera work, yeah. particularly like in the indie film world where they're trying to like, you know, you've got filmmakers who are working with more limited budgets and they're trying to find like any leg up that they think that they can get. And they're like, well, if we cast this other actress that has like a million, you know, Instagram followers, it's like a certain amount of like free marketing for our film if she's in it or whatever. Um, with voiceover, I find that it's actually not so much about influencers as it is about celebrity casting a lot of times I see now. that like the Mario Mario movie is quite a I'm thinking of, the, of that because it's the you know the it's just come out and uh yeah I mean all of those actors are great but huge celebrities and so how how do you feel or how does you know, your side of the industry and the community feel when you're maybe not getting a look in because it's just about the celebrity. There's nothing wrong with it, but what are your opinions on it, I guess? I mean, it's kind of one of those, like, I mean, A, I will say that I have not been directly affected by it. Like, you know, it's like, I'm not Charles Martinet. I haven't been doing a character for, you know, 20 plus years and then I'm passed up, you know, for a celebrity. So I, I don't have that, like, real personal direct connection to it. But it's kind of one of those, like, 
I have my own personal feeling about it. I would love for that not to be the case and for the decision makers to have more trust in either the original fandom or the work rather than the name attached to the work. But at the end of the day, it's not my decision. Yeah. You know, it's like, I'm not the one like footing the bill. I'm not the one who even made up the character. I'm simply giving a voice to it. So yeah, I would hope that, you know, if I was in an indie game and then they made it, you know, into like a big blockbuster animated something that I would be at least given the opportunity to audition. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, it's not like... It's not my call. And it makes me understand why so many people have that drive to create their own content, because then that's, that's the only time that you often really have like the decision-making power. Absolutely. Have you ever had that drive to go? I mean, you work, you know, on, on you know, your resume is amazing, you know, but do you, have you ever had that drive to go, you know what? I want to make something kind of weird or I want to like, do something for me, like, and control it completely from start to finish. If you had that kind of drive. You know, it's interesting. I haven't. And it's not that I haven't had the desire to work on something like out of the box or away from what I'm known for or whatever. It's just that I've never experienced that hyphenate desire. Like I've never really wanted to direct. I've never really wanted to write. I feel so strongly that my talent lies in being a cog in a greater machine. Like I love meeting passionate people, hearing their story that they want to tell and being like, I can help you tell that. Yes. Like I can help you in this unique way. And like, that's what lights me up, the collaboration and and the being a part of that team. I don't know why I just, at this point in my life, who's not to say that it will change, yeah. but I haven't had that drive where I'm like, oh, I have, I have a story inside of me that I'm just like burning to tell. No, I mean, not everyone, that's the thing. We're all sort of, we all have sort of different vibes and that's the good thing about this sort of industry. Everyone kind of like embodies and uh, different sides of it. Um, I I like that side of like, you know, being a facilitator, but I think the older I'm getting, the more I'm thinking, I don't want to be beholden to anyone else. And like I've started to think, I think I just want to make my own stuff. That's what I want yeah. to do. Um, I still want to work with others because that's when you learn, you know, and there's so many amazing creative people that I've met and I'm so inspired by. But at the same time, I think, yeah, I just want to, I just want to do my own thing. That's why I've been very drawn to go back to stand up again. Cause I'm like, well, I'm just going to stand here and be this and no one can tell me what to do because it's my story which is it's my story elizabeth i said oh my god i want to watch you do stand up so bad <laughs> oh my god. i'm very i'm very it's very early days i started last year and then because of personal reasons i stopped and then i collected a lot of very strange stories and then i went back to it and i'm now going back to it and i think my new thing will be every time i go to america i'm going to try and do an open mic in a city uh, oh, that's cool. Try and do that. It's because I, I find that I like, I love stand up. I don't care about dying on stage or anything. I think it's fun. Like, it's just, I, I really don't care. I think I'm not, I'm not married to it. So I just kind of go, if people don't laugh, I'm like, okay, I'm going to the next thing then. I don't, I really don't care. Have you ever stood on a stage and, fit, and not felt any energy? It is weird. It's a weird feeling, really. Not in a while because I, ha I haven't done. I haven't done like live theater type yes. stuff in a while, but I did do uh, a lot of live theater when I first moved to LA and oh boy. Yeah. If mm. there were some, there were some rough nights where we either like didn't have a, like didn't hardly have a crowd or like, it was like performing for stone statues. Oof. It's, it's rough. Um, I commend you because I think it, it takes a very 
special kind of like bravery and confidence to kind of like be able to put yourself out there and not care about the result, you know? But when it goes well, theater, I imagine theater is exactly the same. I've never done theater. I'm not an actor, but it, the, the feeling is just great. It's very addictive. What is that feeling like for you when you're feeling the energy from people? It's like a, it's like um the most beautiful, like regenerative, you know, giving cycle you can think of. You know, when you have an audience that's like really picking up what you're putting down and 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 feeding you their energy, it makes you feel like you're capable of doing more than you thought in a way. It just it elevates everything. And it's. You know, because give, giving of yourself in the way that we do with acting can be very draining. Mm. Um but that cycle in live theater is very, it fills your cup a lot, I find. No notion to maybe get right back into theater or are you quite happy with where you're at right now? I um I love theater, but I am also a Capricorn moon. <laughs> I am like, I am a realist. And I decided a long time ago, I was just like, as a country, we do not support live theater enough for me to be willing to try to make money or like support myself doing it unless I was like, you know, independently wealthy and really famous. And, you know, like a lot of actors, I was like, I'm going to take a season off and do an off Broadway yes. show. <laughs> uh, I mean, that would be amazing, but you know, theater more than anything, more than movie making even, like requires so much of you, like the amount of time that you have to like put into rehearsals and usually it's not paid or it's not well paid, you know? And then and then the toll that it takes on like your physical and emotional body, like when you're actually doing the run of the show, it's a lot. It's, I think the most difficult of all the, the arts. Oh yeah. And and we just, we don't compensate it really very well in this country. And I was like, I'm not even gonna, I, I want to be able to, I want to be able to like make a living doing what I do. Same. <laughs> so. Same. I know what you mean. Like, I like nice things. <laughs> like, so I would like to eat nice food and have nice things. I mean, that's even with the stand up, stand up's not bread and butter for me. It's presenting, but um. I've, I, I, you, I gotta like pick and choose my moments when to do it because it's it's more like oh this is fun this is fun and I'm just doing it and it's an experiment as opposed to no this is this is the thing that makes money and that's sad because I think the older you get as well you know I, it, I certainly like my security and I like to know that I can pay my bills so I, I, I we talked about risks earlier sometimes some risks have to be balanced out and so that is one where I'm like Mm, my intuition says I should do it, but I'm like just being very careful. That's where my Capricorn moon's going. Mm, like just watch yourself. So it's it's difficult, but I'd love to be able to do whatever you know. Ma imagine, imagine. Okay, imagine <laughs> Elizabeth, if you could do anything as an actor right now, right? You get the genie in the bottle. Okay, the genie comes out. It's uh, you know what Robin Williams. Um, and he's like, okay, what do you want as, a, as a, for your career as an actor? Go for it. What would you say? Would you go, I want to be on Broadway or I want to be like on camera. What, what would you do? What would you say? Ah, God, that's a really interesting question. And you'd think that I would like have like a real specific answer for it. But the first thing that popped into my brain is that I want to do something that is long running. Like my favorite thing in the world is like getting into like a good book series, you know, like where you're with the characters for like mm -hmm. multiple books and you really get to like dive in and, and explore that character over a longer period of time and like many different situations. Like, I've always loved it. I think it's one of the reasons why I was so attracted to reading fantasy series when I was younger and why I've always really loved, you know, like 
longer RPG video games and stuff. And so I I think that would be my answer. It's like, I, I, at this point, I really don't care if it was like, you know, getting to be in, you know, like a really great story-based AAA video game, like, you know, The Last of Us and, and Horizon Zero Dawn and stuff like that. Or if it was an animated TV show, or if it was a live action TV show, it's like, I don't, I don't even really care at this point, which form it would take. Like, I just want to be involved in something that's like juicy and long running where I can really like, really dig in over a longer period of time. That's a really good answer. Because I thought you might go for the, oh, I just want to, you know, do this movie or that or whatever. But actually, that's a really good answer. Because then you, well, you, you've got a longer running job, which is great. Because then you're just well, like, sure, yeah, job security. <laughs> I always say that, like, I like a nice regular gig, you know, like that. That would be lovely. But you've got the job security, uh, but at the same time, it's that kind of like it's feeding the brain, it's feeding the soul, a little bit more. You're learning, you know. I like that answer. Um, but Elizabeth, it has been wonderful talking to you on this podcast we've covered lots of subjects here my god uh, yeah we've got from decisions to woo woo stuff to genie in a bottle uh, all framed by capricorn moon libra sun and <laughs> sasha chairs rising <laughs> this has been a powerful podcast powerful uh before we uh go elizabeth for those i'd like to say for those who are thinking about making big decisions big changes they're unsure, what would you say to them? I think that the obvious answer of like, kind of trying to like follow your intuition is 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 smart and, and you should do it. But I think for me, what was so powerful and, and what reacquainted we, me with my intuition as an adult is that I got really clear on what my priorities were first. Like when you really take the time to like get to know yourself and know like, this is what is important to me. This is what I want out of my life, not just for career, but also personally, you know, familially, spiritually. When you get really clear on that, it makes the intuition stuff happen so much faster and so much easier. So I don't know, take the time to do that, like hard, hard getting to know yourself work first. Um, and then listen when that intuition comes in. <laughs> Hell yeah, intuition, not fantasy. That's what Instagram has told us. So, and, and if you don't want to listen to Elizabeth's words, just go on Instagram, because clearly uh, that's, where we, <laughs> that's where we learn everything now. That's it. That's, that's, I know myself more because I spent time in the scroll hole. That was, that's pretty much it. Um, Elizabeth, you've been amazing. Um, for those watching on YouTube or listening to this on Spotify and all the other places, uh, please hit the subscribe button. Um, and please make sure that you follow Elizabeth. All of her links will be everywhere when, when, when I put it out. Uh, so make sure you go follow her on Instagram and all that kind of thing. Um, Elizabeth, you've been wonderful. I hope we get to see each other again soon. It was wonderful talking. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Um, my name's Claire. This has been Hot Pod Time Machine. I'm Claire. This is Elizabeth. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. Bye. Hot Pod Time